This is the Fostering Church Podcast, giving you and your church clarity about where to focus so that you can help provide more than enough for children and families in foster care in your community. Here are your hosts, Jason Johnson and Jason Weber. Welcome to the Fostering Church Podcast. I'm Jason Johnson, and I'm here with my friend, Jason Weber. Hey, Jason. Hey, Jason. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. You know, when you're on vacation and the day before you have to leave is a mixed bag of emotions. So on one hand, you're happy to be on vacation still. But on the other hand, you're a little sad because you know it's almost over. That's kind of how this episode feels a little bit to me. Yeah, for sure. It is episode six in our seven part series, which means it's almost over. Wah, wah. Uh, but <laughs> we're really uh, going to enjoy today because the pillar we're covering and the guests we're talking to are fantastic. Last episode, we had an awesome conversation about relational support. And today we're talking about leadership. Yeah. And today's topic of leadership is an important one because it really speaks to setting our ministries up organizationally to be effective and sustainable. And our guest today is going to be great. Leslie Reese is on staff at North Point Church based out of Atlanta, and she leads all their foster care and adoption ministry efforts there. This is a church that is known for many things, among which is how they do leadership, how they teach on leadership, how they train and equip other leaders on leadership. And so it's going to be great. But before we dive in, I have a very important question for you, Jason. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Let's hear it. Great. If you could hop in a DeLorean that's outfitted with a flux capacitor and go visit yourself in high school, knowing what you know now at what, 29 years old? Is that about what you are these days? Yeah, give or take 18. Um, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, knowing what you know now as a grown man, what would you say to your high school self? Mm Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I think, you know, first thing I think is, uh, Hey, nice mullet, man. Looking good. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I've heard rumors about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, secondly, you know, I, 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 well, one, I think I would say, Hey man, uh, you know, all that money you're spending on Mountain Dew every day, uh, invest (laughs) Invest that in Apple uh, right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he'd say Apple. What's Apple? And you'd be like, yeah. trust me. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, no, really, I, what I probably actually say is, hey, you know, everyone around you is just as insecure as you are. Mm. So mm. get out of your own head and just start loving people and mm. stop worrying about how you're seen uh, so much. Mm. And, and just love people well. That Honestly, that's probably what I tell myself. How about you? Mm, that's good. Um, I would start off by saying, stop bleaching your bangs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Um, I would also say it's time to lose the earrings. Believe it or not, <clears throat> the ears mm. were pierced. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, similarly, uh, wait, my... Wait, wait. I, oh gosh, so I was trying to move no, move on. We're okay. we're gonna stop there. So no, no, no. So were you, what, did you do the the stud like the stud that you get at Claire's when you get your ears pierced? You know, did you stick with the stud or were you a dangly earring? No, I went from I went from the Claire stud. And let me say this: this is this kind of gives you an indication of the home I grew up in. My parents were always like daring us to do stuff or betting us, like, hey. My dad one time said, um, I bet you can't teach yourself how to juggle. I'll pay you $10 if you do. And so I did. And looking back now, I know what he was doing. He was like, hey, how can I get this kid away from me for a few hours or a few days to teach himself how to juggle? I'll pay you 10 bucks, right? But I did. So uh, we were at the mall getting my little sister's ear pierced. And my mom said, uh, I bet you won't get your ear pierced. I'll pay for it if you do. So I sat down and I did, right? Because that's just how we rolled. So I eventually went from the stud to the hoop. And I stuck with the hoop uh, through most of, of high school. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. So sorry to interrupt you. So yeah. we've got the, we got the bleach right. bangs, right. we got the earrings. Okay. What, what else? Yeah. I mean, if you can just picture all of that, uh, I'd probably say lighten up, man. And I probably say that to even the 42 year old, almost 42 year old version of Jason, but Hey, lighten up my insecurity 
kind of express itself in, I would just retreat. And uh, um, I was really, really good at being alone. Uh, I'd go see movies alone. I'd go eat at like Applebee's alone, which was like super nice back then. So maybe you still like Applebee's. Uh, just lighten up, have fun, have friends, um, and everything's going to be okay. That's what I would, that's what I would say. So, mm. well, uh, you know, not only has our guest today, Leslie Reese, been to high school, duh, but she has a pretty powerful story to tell about her high school days, which included an unexpected move across the country and accidentally graduating early, oddly enough. And I think you'll be encouraged by how God has used some of her experiences to lead her into the work that she's in now. All right. Yeah, let's go to that conversation with Leslie Reese. Well, hey, Leslie, thanks so much for being with us here today. It's my pleasure. So Leslie Johnson was telling me you've got a pretty interesting story about uh, not only graduating high school early, but you did that on accident. I I don't have any. I don't know how that works. Can you tell us about that? I most certainly can. And I will also tell you that it it actually connects to the, this current chapter of my life and even just working in the foster care space in an odd sort of way. So when I, I grew up in the upper Midwest in Minneapolis, um, spent a few years in Iowa when I was a kid, but then um, in my early teens, my parents divorced. And then a little while later, maybe, I don't know, let's say three years later, my mom went on a vacation to Brownsville, Texas, and she was supposed to be gone maybe two weeks. And then, but she stayed gone six and she came back already married to somebody we'd never met. Hmm. We moved there and, you know, I got to experience the culture shift of, you know, Minnesota to border town, Texas. Um, but I also got to discover that the school system ran out of curriculum at the end of my junior year for me as a student. Hmm. And so literally at the end of my junior year, they were like, you're done. You're done. You're done. <laughs> and of wow. course there was no, there was no exit ramp. Like nobody had made a plan for me to do the end of high school as a junior. And although I know, I think I'm brilliant. It had nothing to do also with my <laughs> talent or my abilities. It just, they ran they out, just ran out. Of yeah. things to teach me, man. What an interesting story. A couple of years of growing up real quickly. I, I suppose there, not that you weren't growing up enough before, but and you know what? Uh, I wish that I had um, shown up at high school one day somewhere in my junior year and they said, go home. We have nothing left for you. Uh, I would have, <laughs> I would have gladly accepted that invitation. Um, perhaps not with some of the story that surrounded yours as well. I, I, I can't. No, imagine. honestly, I was not complaining. And, and back to my thing about how I think it connects a little bit, even just the four story on that and the fact that my parents divorced and there was a lot of chaos and some kind of interesting parenting decisions made along the way. Mm. Um, that was just my mom's side of it. But it, I think all of that kind of led in that early stage of my young adulthood for me to feel a little bit less than probably than other kids whose families were stable. Mm. Um, but then as I got further down the road in life and was able to look backward, I was like, well, that developed some really unique resiliency in me. And I think that it gives me a huge amount of compassion and passion for kids in care mm. and how their stories have been very disrupted and therefore that, yeah, they need people to walk alongside them and help them put the pieces together of those messy stories that they have so that they can find the resiliency in it mm. um, and build on that into the future. So, Wow. And in just the first few minutes of the episode, we've got enough. That's it. Thanks for joining us. That's, okay, that's uh, done. Man, that is so good. Um, <laughs> definite connection there. And we're excited to actually unpack that a little bit with you here. You mentioned now you're a wife, a mom, a grandma. Uh, you've had a successful mm -hmm. career in the marketplace and for several years now have been on staff at your church overseeing all things foster care and adoption and everything associated with that. And so uh, first and most importantly, can you tell us your grandma name? And then can you tell us a little bit about your family, your career, and just kind of how that led into your role at the church? So number one, grandma name. That's the most important. The grandma name is Lala. Lala. Where did that come Lala. from? Well, most babies say dada first and then mama. I was not going to be left <laughs> behind for long. So I picked something that ah. would come quickly after those. 
Um, it also happens to be my initials. My name's Leslie Ann. So it fits all of the things. And my husband chose Papa, so he was not going to be far behind me either. So very strategic. I get it. Nice. I think the other part of your question was a little bit about my background. Mm -hmm. I went to University of Texas at Austin for about three and a half years and was uh, majoring in business there and then had another disruptive event when I was um, the fall of my what would have been my senior year in college in Austin. My mother died unexpectedly. So I left college for a year and a half, waited tables, really felt lost, you know, and then landed back at University of Texas, Dallas about a year and a half later finished my degree in accounting and finance, went to work in big eight public accounting as a tax consultant straight out of college, Um, spent a few years in Dallas doing that type of work and then transferred my career and my life to Atlanta, Georgia in the fall of 1986, still doing the same kind of work. I navigated my way to the Coca-Cola company Mm -hmm. and went to work there first as a mergers and acquisitions manager. For several years, I traveled around the country buying and selling companies Anyway, I stayed there for 11 years. Um, and in my late 30s, I retired because I had had four of my five children. And 13 years later, started working again in a completely new field. But I would argue, and we'll get to this in a minute, that it, if you understand yourself really, really well as a person, which is the first thing, everything you know how to do is portable. You can pick it up and move it into another context. You just have to understand yourself really well in order to be able to do that. So everything I knew how to do in business was needed when I came into this ministry position many years later. Now, Leslie, uh, you know, for a lot of people listening to this podcast, they're wanting to find ways to help their church become more actively engaged in foster care. And a lot of folks in that category, a lot of us, uh, you know, tend to be doers by nature. And so a lot of the pillars we've been talking about are doing oriented things like um, offering tangible support, um, communicating, relational support, recruitment and discipleship. And that makes a lot of sense. But but today we're talking about leadership, which kind of feels a, a little bit different than some of those things. Can you help us understand why having a good leadership structure in place is so important to the overall mission of serving kids and families well? Wow, that's a big question, right? And I want to just, before I answer the question about having a great leadership structure in place, I want to say you have to have great clarity about what you're trying to do. And so if you're not clear on that, you could you could overbuild your leadership structure um, for what's actually at hand. And on the, on the flip side, if you aren't clear on that, you could um, select the wrong people to do the work that you have in mind. So in our case, our church wanted to build something that would, that would grow and that would be sustainable and that was high quality and was also, I could use two different words to describe the same concept, repeatable or portable, because we have multiple campuses. So we knew that we had to be able to carry it elsewhere. And also because of the type of organization that this is, we know that other churches are often leaning in and asking for guidance. And so we couldn't design something that simply only worked for us and wouldn't be easy for anybody else to pick up and and model after or borrow from or, you know, implement. So, so anyway, I think it's really important to be clear on what you're trying to do. Let me, let me give you a small example of what I mean. I think that there's nothing wrong with a church that wants to start by figuring out if they have any foster or adoptive families in their, in their congregation and only decide to support those people. Well, like to me, that that's a huge first step. And If that is what they want to do, there are lots of models out there for how to support families well that they could lean into. But what they probably need as a leader in that context then is someone who's really strong in administration, right? Mm. In our case, we were trying to create something that was a little more pioneering, had a larger context to it, and and someone who is an excellent administrator wouldn't have been able to probably cast the vision and create the supportive structures within the organization, create the relationship pathways, both inside and outside the organization. And honestly, I'll point at myself, I would flunk at the administration of this ministry um, because that's not my gift. I have other women on my team who are phenomenal 
at that. And so their strengths balance out my weaknesses and vice versa. So we built a team that really kind of um, has all of the different qualities because of what we're trying to do. Yeah. You know, you bring up a great point um, that you guys are in a position where you can look at what you want to do and then you make a choice accordingly about the leader that you need in order to do that. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the people that we talk to are in a position where they're, they're sitting there thinking, choose a leader. What are you talking about? Like I, I never, I'm leading this thing and I didn't want to, I never set out to lead anything. All I wanted to do was care for children and families. And now I'm apparently leading this foster care ministry at my church. And I don't know if I really have what it takes to do that. We hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can speak to to those folks and what kinds of things that they need to do to build into themselves, but also to surround themselves with the kinds of people that will help Mm -hmm. uh, create good leadership for a ministry. Yeah, that's, I mean, gosh, that's such a great question. I'll, I'll back up and say same, same idea, which is, you know, know yourself, know your strengths, be fine with them, be good with your strengths, you know, whatever they are. And then also know what are your weaknesses? What are the things that you're not good at? And in my opinion, the most healthy thing you can do is fill those gaps with other people who those are their strengths, because then everyone working together is thriving by contributing their strengths. So it's a much more collaborative model. So say you've got somebody that's sort of been handed the ministry and they're really, they're really good at, I'll use a word that we haven't used yet in this conversation. Maybe they're really good at pastoring. Maybe they're really good at getting one-on-one with a foster parent or an adoptive parent that's in a hard place and really loving them well. Okay. Maybe they're not good at administration and that ministry has six of those families and they're trying to do more than just pastor. Well, then you need to find somebody to come alongside that person, even in a volunteer capacity, who's good at building systems and processes and spreadsheets and keeping track of all the bodies that are going to be engaged in supporting those families, because that's real work that honestly, some people thrive in. I don't, but others do. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the challenge of, well, maybe you already have this, this, you know, ministry where there's, you know, five, six, seven families. Now you've got your administrative person and they're building support around them. And now maybe the church is asking you, should we do more? Right. And maybe the caring person and the administrative person are at a loss as to what the more might look like. And they know that their skills are probably not going to necessarily be appropriate or perfect for figuring that out. Then it's again, another kind of collaboration where you maybe reach out inside that church organization and find somebody that is one of those inventors, you know, one of those people that really likes to think big about the future. And maybe you just borrow some talent for a while in order to try to cast vision in all of that process, keeping your ear on the families and what they have as a value equation. Because I think one of the biggest mistakes I've seen some organizations do, and we did it in the very first instance, is we caught an idea of what we wanted the ministry to be um, to kind of look and feel like, but we didn't ask the people that were in the trenches, the foster and adoptive families, what was their most highly felt need. And so we sort of surpassed them in our effort and had to back up at a later stage and try to figure out how to make that right. Cause it wasn't right. We didn't ask the most important people, what would be most helpful. Mm. We just caught a vision and moved forward. Wow, what a super practical question that a lot of church leaders might be asking, and maybe the answer is right there in front of them. What should we do and what should we focus on? And um, maybe the first question as well, have you asked the people that you intend to serve? Like, where are they mm. and what are they feeling and what are their needs? And and I love the focus on knowing yourself enough uh, to know how to invite other people around the table and Have you seen, Leslie, in that um, instances where some of those people around the table, some of the best minds and and, um, maybe administrative people or or inventors and dreamers or even in other roles aren't necessarily personally involved in the foster care and adoption space? Maybe they've never fostered or adopted, but they bring some gifts to the table administratively or 
um, in accounting, like your background, or just um, organizational thinking. Yeah. Um, so can you kind of speak to encouraging leaders to think, maybe even think outside the box a little bit in terms of who's who needs to be on the team and around the table? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I will always lean on my tendencies, right, to want to create something that has strong process and strong systems underneath it. And somebody else might come along and be able to throw in a great idea about how to bring energy to it, right? Enthusiasm to it. So you don't want all of my strengths all the time because you're going to, you're going to have something that runs like a machine and you're going to have very little energy, enthusiasm, mojo, whatever you want to call it. Right. So I think the thing to know is that you have to figure out again, back to what are you trying to accomplish? You know, what, what is the thing that you're trying to do? Most of the stuff is actually simpler than you think, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. creating a gathering where families come together and feel seen and understood by others just to eat pizza or have, you know, cupcakes together, donuts on a Sunday, knowing that they're a part of something bigger than themselves is a huge thing. Um, those aren't expensive or hard things to do and they don't require a massive staff. Um, Mm -hmm. but they're building block things that allow you to start to galvanize, um, the people who you want to hear from. I also think it's important though, at that very baby step stage in the very beginning to also, because you're clear about what you do want to do to take a deep breath and be okay with what you're not going to do. Mm, That's good. Um, saying no is is the most powerful part of developing a ministry that's sustainable. So small example, we have huge facilities. And for the first couple of years, other organizations, people in the organization, people who were, who were fostering could not understand why we would not do a supply closet. It seemed like a simple ask. My answer was no, and it was multifaceted. One is there were supply closets in the community for this purpose. So somebody else was already doing that work. So be aware of your community, be aware of what else is already going on. And if you want to help them go farther, faster, do that. Don't create a competitive thing in your environment that then causes you to have to sort of um, thin out the resource base that's available. The other thing is though, that is a very heavy administration activity and you have to figure out how to make it accessible and the type of accessibility that a foster family needs is very random, right? Mm -hmm. You can't know what time of day, you can't know what day of the week. And so all of those logistical things, plus the fact that we have eight campuses spread out across Atlanta made that idea completely unsustainable. Even if we had wanted to, we would not have been able to do it well Again, high quality, sustainable, um, you know, and portable. It it didn't fit our small framework for what we were willing to say yes to. So anyway, not saying other people shouldn't do that. I'm just saying you have to kind of know what can you, what can you say yes to that, you know, you can follow through on over and over again and be willing to say no. If you're pretty sure that at least for now, it's not a good yes. It's not a strong yes. Leslie, you've unpacked so much good stuff and um, even maybe even for my own sake, but maybe for other listeners as well, want to recap a little bit. I love the ideas of high quality, sustainable, and even portable. And, you know, the the volunteer church leader at a, a relatively smaller church um, out there in the community might feel like, why does this need to be portable? What what does that mean for us? And what we find over and over again is that um, when a church does something like this high quality and sustainable, other churches around them are looking to them for guidance. And how are you doing what you're doing? Can you help us? And so... I want to encourage even those that might be, um, uh, you know, working solo right now in their church and they feel like the lonely leader or the lonely advocate um, that when you when you do the things that you need to do and you do them well, as Leslie has said, that you learn to say no to certain things in order to give your best yes to some things um, and you do them with high quality and sustainability, um, others will look to you. 
and they'll say, how, how are you doing what you're doing and, and how can you help us? I'll never forget. That was the case at our church when I was pastoring our church in Houston. Um, we were making stuff up as we went, to be honest with you, just throwing stuff up against the wall, but it really all came down to what do the families in our church need most? Let's start there. Let's make sure that they're well taken care of. Um, and then over time, other churches in Houston started to reach out and they asked the question, how did you do what you're doing and and can you help us? And for a long time, we didn't have a good answer to that question, right? Like we we wanted to say, oh, we didn't do it. God did it because that kind of sounds, you know, it, <laughs> it deflects. Yeah, it, it's churchy <laughs> and it deflects the glory to him. But we found that our deflecting to him was actually kind of um, an excuse for us to not be very helpful, right? And so we decided we actually want to have a helpful answer to that question because we want to see more churches around us get engaged in this. And um, that was a growing season for us because we really had to figure out who are we and what is it that we're doing and how do we do it? Um, and can we do it in a way that's helpful for other churches around us? We've talked a minute here about individuals knowing themselves, but I also am a big proponent of knowing the DNA of the church that you're involved in. And making sure that the things you do fit the DNA of that church. Mm -hmm. Don't try to do things that are just outside the nature of the organization that you are working with. There's no reason to do that. It, you, things will go much better for you if you do things that work mm -hmm. inside its context. So, for instance, some churches are very good at the Sunday meal thing. You know, they, they have a great capacity for meals. If that's the case, make sure your families that you're supporting are beneficiaries of that. It's part of the DNA of your church. It's a great thing. Our church does not have that DNA. Getting meals to people, it's Uber Eats. Like we, we don't have that culture. So we're not able to do that well. It's, it's kind of a side note for us, not a main thing. Let the main things that your church is good at be the main things that you try to leverage first. Mm. Mm. What a great point. To that point, can I ask you a, a question that I think feeds right into to what you're talking about, just recognizing the culture and the values of the church that you're working within? Um, and I want to ask you from that a question about how to lead when you're not in charge. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how, do I, how do I be a leader in the ministry that I oversee within a, a a larger church context that I might not be fully in charge of. Uh, you, you're, you yourself are on staff at a, at a church that has a lot of different systems and processes. There's others who make decisions about budget and vision and direction and how and when things will be communicated. That's a big one we hear often mm -hmm. is, I want this communicated more by my church, but I'm not in those decision-making rooms and meetings. So how would you encourage those who are leading in a ministry environment? I would say the vast majority of those who are leading this ministry are leading in a context where they're not fully in charge. Yeah. How do you do that well? How do you do that graciously? How do you do that humbly? But how do you do that um, confidently as well? I think the short answer is to be really clear about your why why do you want what you want? Who has the power to say yes? And why would they not want what you want? So you kind of have to know who your audience is and you have to navigate your way into understanding what are their sensitivities? What are the, what are the problems that your ask would create for them? And before you even make the ask, solve those problems. Mm, <laughs> At least good. in your own mind. Um, mm. Because... Nobody in any context of work that I've ever worked in anyway, wants someone to bring them a problem <laughs> that they want them to solve, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it requires a little bit more intentionality to sit back and say, well, Hey, what do I really need? You know, what, what would I, or it could be, what do I really, what would I really like to have? Okay. In our case, I'll give you an example. We are, founded as a foster care ministry. We have lots and lots of adoptive families in our congregation and lots of families who have adopted in the ministry, but the ministry core is still foster care focused. And so back when we were looking for visibility on Sunday morning, I 
thought about it and I was like, well, they're, they're not going to do it. It's just not how we roll. Our Sunday mornings are heavily programmed. We don't do specialty ministry, promotional stuff. Um, but I'm still going to ask, but I'm going to ask because it's foster care awareness month. Okay. It's national foster care awareness month. So I chose my timing based on something that I thought could be compelling. I made my ask be very petite in terms of where it would fit and how it would land in the service. But I also made the ask fit in the service where I actually believe people would be in their seats with their hearts open. So in our case, we call that the vision moment. It's after the worship music and before the sermon begins. There's a brief little moment there where they usually highlight something. And so I asked for that moment. And then I also did the homework to figure out how to make that ask super locally relevant for the pastor of that church. So it wasn't a grand ask about foster care or adoption in the macro. It was, hey, did you know at Woodstock City Church that there are 356 kids in foster care and 275 of them are not in the county because there's an insufficient base of families to take care of those kids? So we made it like hyper relevant to the people sitting in those seats on that day. And what was said at Buckhead Church looked different than that. And what was said at North Point Church looked different than than that during the month of May. Also gave them not just one day that I wanted it. I said, you can do it anytime from (laughs) mid-April to the beginning of June. You pick. So you remove some of the obstacles when you don't get so focused on your exact when or your exact how. So pretty much for 10 years, that's what we've done. We've had a, we've had a vision moment in May and then we have a website that works for us year round. And we have the ability through our social media platforms to amplify the ministry through other mechanisms that don't require a pastor to stand in front of the congregation and say anything. So Leslie, the answer you just gave to that was, is so incredibly practical. Like that was such uh, amazing stuff. And, you know, at the core of that was this idea of, which should be true for all of us, no matter what we're doing is think like your audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a teenager and you're asking your dad for 20 bucks, you ought to be thinking like your audience. My audience is my dad. What's going through his head. If you're, if you're an agency trying to go to a pastor and getting, you know, airtime, so to speak, you need to be thinking like that Mm -hmm. pastor. That is such good advice. And, um, for you to apply it in this case, uh, when you're trying to figure out, um, how to lead in this context, to think like you're, uh, when you're not the leader, mm-hmm. think like your leader is thinking and, and solve the obstacles that they are coming up with in their mind. Um, you mentioned DNA. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that seems to be true, just observing, uh, about the DNA of your church is that it does a really good job of pushing leadership out that it, it gives uh, volunteers, it gives lots of people the opportunity to use their gifts to lead and to, to push it out. And I think one of the temptations for anybody in a, in a leadership position is to keep um, responsibility in and, and not push it out because it's easier. It feels easier to do it myself. It feels easier to just get it done than to push it out to others. Can you talk about any deliberate specific things you all do at North Point to keep leadership flowing out to others and through others? I think our church strategy in general, because it's built on volunteer leadership, I mean, the, the, the largest number of leaders that we have are unpaid people. Having said that, on the paid staff side of things, if, if I'm going to make myself a major feature on the critical path of getting things done, we're going to get far less done. It might feel better to me as a fairly task-oriented person to have my elbow grease and all of it, but the multiplier effect is never going to be there. I don't know. It's almost just too intuitive to me to think about. Back in the days when I was at Coke, I worked for a man who, he was brilliant. I mean, really, really, really brilliant and constantly frustrated because the ideas that he had and the things that he wanted to do never seemed to get done as quickly as he knew he could do them, right? And Mm -hmm. I said to him one day, Steve, the ideas are the easy part. It's getting them done through others, through others that is the real work. Like that's 
how you empower and enable other people to bring their gifts in order to get the thing done that you have a shared vision on is where all the power that I think that's just God's way. Even, I mean, he, he didn't choose to do the world himself. He chose to create people, all of us unique, um, all of us with unique experiences, skill sets, talents, whatever. And, you know, he wants us to work with each other and him work through all of us in order to get this multiplier effect accomplished. So it's, it's, I'm giving you a bad answer because I think it's maybe too intuitive to me that it's really, a, it's about my team thriving in the work they do and them then pouring out what they have into the people that they're leading so that those people are thriving. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I often um, will read in the gospels of the ministry of Jesus and the disciples just making bonehead decisions and bonehead mistakes. And I think, you know, if I were Jesus, which that statement alone, like there'd be all kinds of problems with the world. But, um, you know, if I were him, I'm thinking it, it'd be so much easier if I just did this myself. Why mm-hmm. do I keep kind of sending these boneheads out to do not that, you know, the people around us are boneheads, but there is a temptation sometimes to say it would just be so much easier if I did it more efficient. But as you've said, you lose that multiplier effect and you lose that sense of people finding their passion and living out their calling and mm-hmm. living into their strengths. And, you know, any, any leader knows that an organization or a program it, if I keep it confined to myself, will will only grow um, to to the capacity that that I'm strong and I'm weak, right? And so there's a pretty mm-hmm. low ceiling in terms of when our weaknesses start to hit that ceiling, and we've maxed out on growth. And uh, so that's so good. And so even as um, whether you're on staff at your church or you're a, a volunteer leader in your church, to really be empowered to think through. Who else do I need around um, in order to do the things that we want to do well? What do we need to say no to now in order to give our best yes to something, to do Mm -hmm. it really high quality with sustainability? And, And then over time, we find that when we can kind of establish proof of concept for our church Mm -hmm. leaders, hey, here's some really good things that God is already doing and there's, there's sustainability in it. It's high quality. We've got multiple people wrapped around this that are leading in different areas and carrying different parts of this. That actually can be a really exciting thing, you know, to for, for that pastor to turn around and see, this is great. This is exactly what I want, that there's that there's good ministry happening and I, I don't have to be right in the middle of it, right? There's proof of concept. Hey, Leslie, it's we've kind of um, hinted at it and and talked about it, talked around it a little bit, but I want to ask you a direct question about working with volunteers um, that I know a lot of our leaders um, face on a daily basis and and are really looking for wisdom on how to navigate. And the question is just best practices for managing and leading volunteers. How do you hold people accountable who are freely giving of their time? How do you, quote unquote, fire a volunteer? Who are you know, who's freely giving of their time, right? Okay. But then also, what are some things that you guys do to celebrate or recognize and honor and really lift up and and um, uh, platform the volunteers who are doing good work? So all that in the question of how do you lead and manage volunteers well? That's a really great question. I'm going to distinguish between two different types of volunteers. Okay, so technically, our foster families are volunteers. Um, serving in this ministry. And then we have three other categories of volunteers, respite families, what we call supporting mentors, which are day and evening type supportive people. And then we have people that we call event volunteers. And so I would say that our team most actively manages those last three categories, the respite families, supporting mentors, and the event volunteers. Because obviously the foster families, they're licensed, you know, they're serving on the front line of the system. So we are more so pastoring them, okay? Not so much managing them. And I just want to distinguish that. And I think that's important to understand. You know, they, yes, they're volunteers of our ministry, but they are not, this is not their, this is not their main relational pathway. They have to keep that pathway with either their child placing agency or their defects office people in the forefront. 
And so we, we view ourselves as mainly pastoring them. The other people, I think it comes down to a casting good vision for them. And so our, the orientation that we offer has cast vision for what their particular role is. It has cast vision for the fact that no role is better than another or more valued than another. So that gives them the freedom, by the way, to choose a role that really seems to fit their stage of life, their capacity, and not feel like they're doing less than, but instead just participating in, in a way that's meaningful that they can do in a sustainable way themselves. Um, and so for that reason, you know, the three different types of roles have different weight to them. The respite family role, the expectation is higher in terms of what they have to go through to even get officially confirmed in that role. The supporting mentor role, we can do that through just church background checks and some online training that we provide. So it's a much more simple set of steps to get into that role. And then the event volunteers, again, we can administer all of that on our own. You could, you could go to an orientation of ours and be an event volunteer or supporting mentor in a matter of days because of the fact that we can handle all of that internally without a third party organization being a part of it. You know, a lot of it comes down to casting vision well and helping them choose what they believe they want to do because then you can hold them accountable to it. If you just try to get them to do something and it isn't necessarily something that they chose, but the something you want them to do, your ability to hold them accountable goes down. (laughs) So once once someone has stepped into a role, the accountability for that role is pretty clear. We don't make it super easy for people to land in any of those roles. Like I just said, you could get into that position pretty quickly, but what it would require of you, I don't want to confuse you too much, but we still put a process in place that requires you to follow through at multiple intersections Mm -hmm. so that you have had to effort your way into the position of serving in this ministry. And here's my reason why. Kids in care don't need casual participation. They need people who will stick to it once they're in their story. And that's even a part of how we cast vision. We talk about the fact that this ministry may not be for everyone, and that's okay. So the the onboarding process in all of the roles requires people to pass through multiple speed bumps along the way. And once they've done that, they've demonstrated to us that they are people who know how to follow through, do what they said they would do do it in a timely fashion. And by that point in time, when we attach them to a story of a child, we feel pretty good that we've got someone who has the right kind of nature to do that volunteer role. We remain open to the fact that people may need to change roles. And so whenever there is an intersection of placement change, we ask everyone that's in a care community whether or not they want to continue or want to change roles. So we look for natural breaks in the children's stories to sort of, you know, pause and reconsider what those volunteers want to do. And then we also have a systematic approach to checking in with them to make sure that it's going well during Mm. the, during the period of time that they're attached to a placement. You know, a lot of it has to do with preparation and vision casting, then, you know, systematic follow-up to make sure that they're doing what they said they would do, um, that it's going well, that there aren't any relational hiccups. Like I said, repopulating them or allowing them to move to different roles. So if you think of it as four different roles, I think of it as seats on the bus. We want them to feel freedom to change seats on the bus. We just want to also try to keep them on the bus, if at all possible. Because there's a lot of waste that goes into onboarding someone into a ministry like this one that deals with kids in care and, you know, trauma issues and then losing whatever um, experience base they have gained. So someone stepping from respite family down to supporting mentor is a celebration for us because they stayed on the bus. Someone stepping down from supporting mentor to event volunteer, it's still a celebration for us because we're keeping them engaged. Someone stepping down from foster family to any other role, it's still a win. We didn't lose that intrinsic value of their awareness, their experience, um, their heart in the ministry. What I hear you focusing a lot on is um, is really we want to ensure downstream health that they're they're in the right seat on the bus, that they're functioning in their gifts and their passion and their passions and 
downstream sustainability. It's a win for us to keep them on the bus. And one of the primary ways you do that is by going way upstream with how you onboard Mm -hmm. and um, really vetting out where people are and who people are um, before they're invited on the bus, frankly. Right. Um, Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's good. The the other thing I love about what you said, Leslie, is it's a principle of um, coll- just a general principle of collaboration that, you know, sometimes we think of collaboration as let's start working together indefinitely on some stuff that's good. And that goes on and on. But what you've said is we built into the system these regular check-in points to allow people to shift seats in the bus, to move places, to say, Hey, we're going to do this for this amount of time and then we'll reevaluate. And that provides really natural places to make adjustments and change the nature of um, the relationship. And I I think that's such a good, uh, it's so good to be able to apply that in a, in a volunteer setting. I love that. Yeah. 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 You asked me another question there and I'll, I'll try to answer it. Um, as tightly as I can. So no person that's approved to participate in our ministry can just accidentally get connected to a kid's story. And so you asked, what do we do when we have a volunteer that we need to sort of, you know, not utilize as heavily? And the answer is we just pay attention. You know, if they've been unsuccessful in a previous placement, then we probably move more slowly to attach them to a next placement. If they haven't um, sometimes after the vetting process, they'll, they'll demonstrate that they are maybe a little bit inflexible, not adaptable enough to be able to take requests on the fly from a foster parent. So we'll be careful about which type of foster parent we attach them to. Um, you know, we just take in all of the information that we gain along the way to try to make sure that we are doing our best to create successful matches. Um, because these are human beings, you know, and they all have their own ways of being. Having said that, I will say to you that it's fairly rare that we have a relationship issue with these engineered connections that we're doing. Where we have seen larger issues in relationships is with foster families who are trying to leverage their natural network because they are trying to take something natural and convert it to something else. The people who we're attaching to them came in expecting to do the things that they're being asked to do. People who are your friends, your family, it's very hard to turn them into supportive serving people and also maintain the natural context of your relationship. So what we love about our ministry model is that we're always, you know, 365 days a year, we're recruiting people into this ministry so that we can have people who want to be in these supportive roles, supporting the families who want the support. So Leslie, I have uh, one more question for you. You're at North Point Church and your pastor is known as a guy who knows maybe a little bit about leadership. Um, So working there, is there a particular principle of leadership you've learned while there that has made a big difference to you and the ministry that you lead? You know, Jason, you and I have had um, conversations in the past and we have a shared love of this word called trust. Mm. I would say that this organization, more than any I've worked in before, and I've worked in a few, um, has an exceptionally high trust culture. Mm. And they know how to foster it and sustain it. And they know how to have the hard conversations when trust is broken and recover from it in the way that our Lord would ask us to. That doesn't mean that nobody ever leaves the organization because of broken trust, but the truth is we work hard at choosing people to come on staff and then trusting them from the minute they're here and dealing with broken trust when it happens and hoping for the best that we're going to get to the other side of it and move forward into another season of growth together. And after being here, believe it or not, a decade, longer than I've been in any job ever, anywhere, Um, I can say, I still see that today. We just had an all staff meeting today. And that, I think that is probably the most, um, outstanding feature of this, this organization led by Andy Stanley and other great leaders that he has, um, you know, brought onto his team over the years. 
so good. Leslie, thank you so much for spending the time with us. This has been so good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Wow. What an awesome conversation about leadership, which on the surface can sound like a dry topic to cover sometimes. But when we get into it, we see just how important good leadership is to doing foster care well in our churches. Absolutely. I love in many ways, this idea of leadership acts as a foundation for everything else we're talking about throughout this series. If we don't have the right people in the right places leading particular areas of this ministry well, things like communication and tangible support and relational support, recruitment and discipleship, all these other things, they can only go so far and can only be so effective. You know, Leslie talked about um, the importance of leadership really being wrapped up in these three ideas of sustainability, quality, and portability. And I thought that was uh, just incredibly helpful. It gives us a lot of context to why it's important we grow strong leadership in our ministries. Absolutely. Absolutely. And don't forget that in every episode show notes, you'll find the Fostering Church PDF guide, which unpacks all six pillars we're covering in this series and provides some application questions for you and your leadership team's to work through. Simply visit morethanenoughtogether.org, click on the podcast link at the top, and you'll find everything that you need there. And we'd also love to connect with you outside of the podcast. And one way to do that is to find us on Facebook. Simply search More Than Enough Together, and you can find us there. That's right. And today was great. Thank you for hanging out with us. We will be back with you one more time for the last episode, episode seven of this limited series. We'll see you next time. This has been the Fostering Church Podcast. Join the Jasons and their guests for all seven episodes dedicated to helping your church provide more than enough for children and families in your community. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts so that we can help more churches help more children and families. The Fostering Church Podcast is a production of More Than Enough, a collaborative movement facilitated by the members and partners of the Christian Alliance for Orphans. For resources related to this episode, click on the podcast link at morethanenoughtogether.org. That's morethanenoughtogether.org. 